I'm Becky from The Seasonal Homestead and today I'm going to be sharing some of my favorite gardening books with you. So a couple of things before I dive into the books. I feel like I need to explain a little bit of why I chose some of these books. So first off, let me give you some background. My first garden was just a couple of raised beds. Then we moved to a new house and we had four raised beds instead of two. We just kept adding on and on and on and I ended up with a lot of raised beds, a little bit of an in-ground gar garden at that place. By the time I was finished at our previous house, I had a pretty large garden at 5,000 square feet. We lived on two thirds of an acre at the time. Something I learned through all of those years where I started out small and worked to get bigger and bigger is that I needed to be more efficient in my growing because it was taking a lot of time and gardening can take a lot of time, especially if you have a big garden. So I started to lean into more of the market garden space because in market gardening, they're growing gardens on a human scale, meaning they're not using large tractors, large machinery. With just a few people and a larger area, they are able to grow a lot of food, so much food. And I wanted to emulate that. So a lot of the books that I like are market gardening books because I felt like I needed to figure out how to be more efficient in my gardening so that I could grow more food because we really want to be able to grow all of our own food at some point. Not all, all, but you know, like 90 to 95% of our own food. I was editing this book video this morning and I realized I needed to add two things to the video. One is that this is not a comprehensive list of my favorite books. I have a lot more and I'll link those down in the video description. And the other thing is that I'm sure there are so many more amazing books out there that I don't even know about. So definitely leave a comment if there is one that is a favorite of yours that I'm missing. So I am past the beginner stage, but I have a couple of beginner books to share because that is one thing that I get asked about a lot is what is a good book if I'm a brand new gardener and beginner and I'm gonna share two of them that I would recommend for beginners. And these are ones that I really wish I'd had when I was beginning. One, I didn't know it even existed. And then this one written by my friend Jill, she just recently wrote it. So it was not around when I was starting, but I wish it was because it's Jill is an expert on teaching beginners how to garden and she words things in such a way that it's, you could have never known anything or heard anything about gardening before, but by the time you finish reading this book, you'll feel like you know what you're doing and you understand all of the terminology and everything that a beginner would need to know. So just showing you the table of contents here quickly, she has information on planting your vegetable garden, building it, planting it, and then maintaining and harvesting all of the important things that you need right there. And then just more of an index section here in the back where she has information on cool season vegetables and warm season vegetables, alliums and herbs. And I'm so glad that she separated the cool season and warm season vegetables. I think that was really smart to do because as a beginner, it's really hard to know what to grow during each season. And I feel like having those things separated really helps you to know when to plant certain things. So she has a really good container soil mix, a raised bed soil mix. I just marked some of my favorite things because I wanted to tell you a fun story about my first garden. So on, with our first garden, I, we built a raised bed and I filled the entire thing from top to bottom with compost because that's what I knew how to do. And it, it actually did okay the first couple of seasons, but what I did not realize is it was really lacking in a lot of the nutrients that are in soil. So you can grow things in compost, but to get all of those micronutrients you need soil in there too. So Jill has included some topsoil in here. She did, um, she knows what she's doing and some compost and then other organic materials, which is a great, that's a great mix right there. Just a very simple and easy to understand, easy to do. So 
already you, you would have a better start than I did. How to transplant, reading a seed packet. I mean, this is genius <laughs> because as a beginner, it can be really hard to understand some of this information on the seed packets. And I, I have never seen this in a book before. It's really cool that she included this in the book. Uh, direct sewing. And then here in the back, here's the cool season vegetables section. I'm really just skimming through this fast. But you, she goes through each vegetable and then just some basic information about each one. Snapshot, starting, growing, harvesting, storing, and then common problems. Spacing is something that I often refer back to books for because I need to remember, okay, peas, you want them closer together, three inches apart. And it will help you to remember all, all of that information. So this is a good reference guide as well. So, and then some suggested varieties for beginners. And she goes through that with the warm season crops too. And, and then that's it really easy to understand and go through. So a good guide for beginners. The next book that is good for beginners all the way up to experienced gardeners is The Garden Primer by Barbara Jamrosh. As you can see, it's very big. So there's a lot of information here. I feel like she just goes all the way from knowing nothing. And then by the time you would finish reading this book, you would be like, an expert in information wise, maybe not in experience if you haven't had a garden before, but information wise, it's like from, you go from top to bottom. So it's a very thorough. So I feel like vegetable gardening for beginners would be like the first book, not overwhelming at all. This one might be a little overwhelming, but it's like all of the basic information and then she's giving you more on top of that. Here's a table of contents. The green side up, planning your property, what plants need, gardening gear, how to buy plants, annuals, perennials, and vegetables. So all the good basics are covered here. Soil pH, how to improve your soil, composting, um, not a ton of visuals in this book. There are a few, it's all in black and white, which I really like visuals, but I feel like this one is so rich in good information that it's definitely worth it to have on your shelf for a reference book. It's a really good reference book. So if you were to look up, like let's say here's one, asparagus, and you needed to know more information about asparagus, you have it all right here and in detail. She even goes into trees, roses, bulbs, which is beyond some of the more vegetable gardening books. And then she has guides on shrubs. So more of the landscape things, wildflowers and houseplants is even in this book. So a, a lot of good, just very thorough information from start to finish. This book is called Will Bonzal's Essential Guide to Radical Self-Reliant Gardening. So definitely up my alley for sure. It, this is one of my very favorite books because it's another person who is doing what I am striving to do, which is pretty unusual. There's a lot of good parts of this book. I made a lot of notes on here. <laughs> Composting as if it mattered. It's the first section, if that gives you any idea of what the book is like. You know, I don't know him, but I like his writing style. The author is a vegan and he doesn't use any animal waste in his gardening. So he does talk about using humanure instead of using animal waste. So some information on that, if you're interested in that, I don't think that's something I will ever dive into, but it is an option. And then green manures, a lot on mulch. He uses a lot of shredded leaves in his gardening. Some information on seed saving, which he is really well versed in. And I feel like he has a lot of experience in. So this is a really good book for seed saving. I think if I'm remembering right, he has a pretty wide variety, like in the hundreds of potatoes that he seed saves every year. And you can see here hanging up some of their tomato plants to ripen. 
and just some of the things that they do to be able to put up food for the year. There's a whole section on that in the back. There is so many really unusual and interesting things that I have never read in any other books in this book. There is even a section on growing grains, which is something that I'm interested in. So I've really enjoyed reading about that and how he grows grains, different grains that you're growing, talks about barley and oats, rye, millet, I mean, rice, field corn, just some information on all of those. And then here he's saving some of his popcorn and dried beans on tarps. This is a really cool chapter. Okay, and then here's another great picture, hand threshing a crop of Jacob's cattle beans. So then oil seeds goes into growing those. And then he has another section on permacrops like fruits and nuts, how they're storing their apples, varieties, pretty much everything you can think of is here for sure. So definitely one to get and dive into. This next one is the Organic Gardener's Handbook of Natural Insect and Disease Control. It's a guide. I haven't really read this cover to cover, but it's nice as something that if I have a problem with one of my plants with disease or with pests, I will go through this book and try and find out what it is. A lot of times when you look at some of these things online, it's not very clear. And so having a book that has been published where they've done this research and they have really good images here, with the information, you know it's gonna be accurate, or at least more accurate than what you would find online. Here you can see, this is the problem solving guide for apples, what goes wrong and why. And then they talk about each of the things that could go wrong with apples. And then they don't have pictures for every single one, but the main ones that people have, like here's cabbages, some of the problems with those. They differentiate here between like, okay, here's what insect damage would look like. Over here, dark stem tissue, this would be more of a disease sort of thing. So they talk about culture, problems, and then they go through a list of problems. So you could basically go through and say, okay, my leaves have brown tips. Causes could be excessive heat, calcium deficiency, I think they also go through some of the solutions that you can do some of the varieties that are resistant to those things, certain problems. It's just a really good guide. Okay, my book's sort of falling apart here, but that's how much I've used it. So insect imposters. Before you squash the bug, take a closer look. So there's common species of beneficial insects that look like pests. And then they have an insect identification guide lots of good pictures and this is a really good thing about these the insect guide is they don't just show like the big bug which i feel like is what you would find on the internet they show the the adult bug sorry you see the adult bug but it's really nice to know what some of the larva looks like corn earworm we're more familiar with maybe what the larva looks like on this one, but what does the adult look like? So you can see the adult moth there. So this is definitely a very valuable guide that I use all the time. Just good to have this one on your shelf if you need to look something up more reliable and accurate than what you would find on the internet. This book is called The Living Soil Handbook, The No-Till Grower's Guide to Ecological Market Gardening by Jesse Frost. This book is so good if you're striving to have a living soil. It goes through everything you would need, all of the pros and cons of every method that you could use, and I really like it for that reason. I marked this page because I thought these principles are so good. And it's, he has down here three principles to farm by. Even if you don't have a farm, they can apply to anybody. So number one is disturb the soil as little as possible. Number two, keep the soil covered as much as possible. And number three, 
keep the soil planted as much as possible. But then he goes through the basic science of living soil, some information on breaking new ground in a garden, and this first part, I had marked this because I liked it so much because it says, context is everything in farming or gardening. And one person's approach to starting gardens in say sandy soil may not be what makes sense for you if you farm in red clay and vice versa. This is so true. Compost in a no-till garden, rifts with compost, deep compost mulch system, talking about straw, hay, haylage, and grass clippings. Synthetic mulches and cover crops. And then he's talking about turning over beds and how you would do that in a no-till system when you're striving for living soil. So silage tarps, plastic mulches, talking about the good and the bad of all of these types of mulches. Path management, so if you have a garden bed and then your paths, what do you put in those? So he's got options here for cardboard and paper, living pathways, mulching in place, and this part three, keep it planted as much as possible. Those principles I read you in the beginning, that's what he divided his book up into is those three parts. For this part, he talks about fertility. So dry farming, soil matter, soil perme permeability, soil biology. Then there's a section on transplanting and interplanting. Some good visuals here of that. I loved this visual of transplanting and interplanting so they won't compete for nutrients and water. And then he has some more good visuals here trellising tomatoes with the lower and lean method. And that's all for this one. Okay, so the next book is called The No-Till Organic Vegetable Farm by Daniel Mays. He runs a market garden called Frith Farm up in Maine. And this book is one that changed the way I gardened. And yes, this is a market gardening book, but can be totally adapted to a home garden. There's a lot of good information in here. Using nature as a model, which I completely believe in and agree with. <laughs> so he talks about integrating livestock and then he's got some information about sheep, laying hens, but the pigs, this is one that I really agree with. And I know not everybody is gonna agree with me on this, but I'll explain why it says, but they can do more damage than a rototiller if they're left in one place too long. This book is about no-till and minimal soil disturbance. So a lot of people use pigs in the beginning of their garden. Like before they start a garden, they'll use pigs to kind of till everything and get all the weeds out, which I think could be a great application. However, and this is what I'm in agreement with here. It says, another caution about pigs is that they can pass internal parasites to humans. Since roundworm eggs can persist in the soil for years, I prefer to keep pigs well separated from the vegetable fields. Pigs evolved as woodland creatures and easily can do more harm than good if integrated with vegetable production. Following nature's models bodes well for all involved. We do not use pigs near our gardens for that reason. Oh, you guys are gonna love this actually. Okay, so here we go. Two ways of mulching here, growing mulch in place and then leaf mulching. So, and then goes through each of the steps. So this goes along with the other book I mentioned, the Living Soil. They kind of go hand in hand here with making sure that your soil is always covered at all times. And I have seen in my own garden what a difference that makes. Another thing about cover crops, he's talking about zero seed rain, which basically just means not having any weeds go to seed and drop those seeds in your garden and how that prevents a lot of future weeds. So here's a picture of their fields and gardens. 
I always love looking at those, even though I don't have like a huge garden area. And I know most of you guys at home are probably just home gardeners too. He's got some really good information about growing cover crops, common cover crops, whether it's an annual or perennial, um, the type of crop, so legumes, and then grasses. Yeah, like buckwheat is insects love its flowers. It's a low biomass producer, but it outcompetes weeds, which is a good thing. I love the visuals. I'm, so, I'm such a visual person, so having visuals in a book for me is really important. And so he's got great visuals in here about winter cover crops. So you've seen me do this in my own garden and the idea of what I did in my garden, it comes from this book. Um, so he's talking about sowing with um, in October and then the growth begins the next spring and then they knock down by hand and foot, cover with tarps, remove the tarps, and then they plant through in situ mulch, which means in place. And then it says, yields are strong with no machines or exposed soil. We only pull a handful of weeds from this 6,000 square foot plot. So then he goes through the same thing with spring cover crops. And then summer cover crops, fall cover crops. So multi-cropping, choosing beneficials, beneficial plants. And then I already showed you the livestock. So the second half of the book is really more geared towards the market gardener side of things where they're talking about employees, price lists and all that stuff. So I don't use that half as much, but there is so much good stuff in this first half of the book. Yeah, so science and soil health. Great book, this one is so good. The Four Season Farm Gardener's Cookbook is one that I actually utilize more for the garden section rather than the cookbook section, even though this was supposed to be more of a cookbook. It's divided into two parts. First half is gardening and the second half is cooking from the garden. Here is the table of contents. So here's the garden section and then they have a lot of recipes in the cooking section. The recipes are very, very simple because in the beginning of this book, they talk about how good food, it doesn't need to be fancy and it can be good just simply cooked. And I'll get to that in a little bit, but first let's do the gardening section and what I love about this section. So the soil, I just marked some of my favorite charts in here. One is this one about soil types. So clay soil, what it's like, loam or sandy, and then benefits, drawbacks, and how to improve it. Which I feel like when you're first starting, this is so essential and super helpful. Then they have an overall plan of their food garden, information about the rotation of their short crops, their tall crops, a chart of vegetable families. Here is a salad garden plan and varieties for the salad garden. This is another thing that I love about this book is they have all of these recommendations for varieties of vegetables to grow. Varieties for the practical garden. And here is a part about saving seed. This, this particular one is from overwintered kale. This is a chart I really love because it's open pollinated vegetable varieties for the self-reliant garden, meaning all of these can be seed saved. And I have grown a lot of these varieties and I can vouch for the fact that a lot of these are really some of the best out there for being open pollinated. They're good producers, hardy. Then they have another one of these varieties charts here for the savory garden. So I really liked all of those. And then they talk about how to grow each of these, how to store them, planting leeks and a technique for doing that. He talks about making it easy, how to start seedlings. Then we have the kitchen section next. Here's all the recipes. So let me flip through here so you can see some of these open face sandwiches, carrot and raisin sandwiches, asparagus and scallion soup, and you'll notice on most of these, there are only very few ingredients. 
Here's soba noodles with vegetables and tahini sauce. I have made this one and it was really good. And then cooking greens. So then desserts in the back and that's all. Then they have some resources where they get their seeds, conversion tables for the cooking aspect of it. A lot of times this stuff in the back is really helpful for being able to find things planting in fall for a winter harvest. They have a chart here in the back, sowing for a spring, summer, and fall harvest, and then they go through each crop. How many rows, inches apart in the row, hardiness map, so, and then the index. This next one is called The Holistic Orchard, Tree Fruits and Berries, The Biological Way by Michael Phillips. Michael Phillips is so smart. <laughs> When I read his books, I'm like, I know nothing. <laughs> Make me feel like a gardening child. <laughs> so he has a lot of good information on the why behind doing things. Okay, so this book has some really good visuals, like here are the types of buds on an apple tree. A lot of stuff on pruning that is very, very helpful. That is, this is basically where I learned to prune is from this book. Plus a friend of ours helped us walk through that as well. In this visual, he's talking about how the root density of a regularly mowed lawn can be as much as 20 times greater than that of a tap-rooted understory. And then he has a section about critters in the orchard and what you can do about it. Nice, uh, a good section here about varieties of this is palm fruits, so we're going through apples. And I think he even goes through some pears in here. Some of the diseases and what you can do about them. Some of the insect pests. And then a section on stone fruits. And then we have a section on berries. Some spacing in a 30 inch wide bed versus an 18 inch wide bed. Varieties recommended some ideas for trellising. So lots of good visuals, ideas, and information in this book, for sure. There are a lot of companion planting books out there, but hardly any of them are science-based. I finally found one book that says it is science-based. One companion planting combo that I do every single year because it's been beneficial for me is planting my potatoes and my beans next to each other. So to start out here, she talks about some of the benefits of companion planting, which there are a lot of benefits for sure, and intercropping some of the ways that you can companion plant. Then she has a good section here on good combos to use. So garden beans and potatoes. This is what I just talked about. This is one that I do all the time because they help each other out. So fava beans and sweet corn. I don't even plant fava beans, so I haven't tried that one yet. <laughs> and then cowpeas and peppers. That is one that I could try because I do grow cowpeas. Um, peas and lettuce, that is a good mix. I've tried that one before. So she has some good combination ones so that you don't have to really figure it out yourself, which can be kind of difficult, like trial and error. I, I do some of that myself. <laughs> Crimson clover and coal crops. That is a good combo. I have tried that. So she's got a lot of good information here that is all science-based. So giving you some good ideas, ideas for pest management, luring, trapping, tricking, and deterring pest insects. Tomato and basil for hornworms. So some of the combos that might deter some of the pests as well. So this is a really great resource. And she goes into a lot more detail that I'm not gonna go into here, but I'll just say it's really good. The best seed saving book I have found is called Seed to Seed by Suzanne Ashworth. This is such a valuable resource and it is a really good reference book. She has a lot of experience and knows what she's talking about, which I feel like is a good indicator that this, it's gonna be a good book if this person has experience and they didn't just do a bunch of research. This book does not have a ton of visuals. I will tell you that. 
not a ton of visuals, but it goes through basically every seed that you could save pretty much. So here's like cowpea. I have been seed saving these for a long time because cowpeas are in breeding plants. So they are not gonna cross with anything else. They're self-pollinating. So they're really easy to seed save, which is why I seed save them. And, and then it talks about how long, how long they maintain 80% germination for four years, 50% for seven years. So very in depth and lots of detail here. This is basically a guide, a reference guide to every seed that you would like to save. It gives you the information you need on how to save that seed. Also gives some good information on whether or not a seed is going to cross and how you might save seed in like a small growing space. Some ideas for keeping it isolated and all that. So excellent reference book. If you're gonna save seeds, you need this book. One of my recent reads is this book by Elliot Coleman called The Winter Harvest Handbook. I have really been loving this because I really enjoy winter gardening and fall gardening. And I really struggle with summer gardening where we live just because it's so hot and there's so many diseases and pests and all, all of those things make it so I want to maximize my winter harvest. And I know for a lot of people, you may not be interested in that. You just want to be done in the summer. But Elliot Coleman lives up in Maine, so it's a pretty cold climate and he is still doing winter gardening. One type of tunnel, and this would be more in line with the home gardener scene, is quick hoops. And the quick hoops is a tool that helps you bend a electrical conduit pipe but I have made these before with PVC. And actually, I think we have a video on that, how we made these. But I, uh, I did purchase a Quick Hoops bender recently so that I could try it this way as well. It talks about how to manage them if you put a row cover over them. And then he talks about, he puts the row cover on in mid-October and then in November, December, they put a sheet of plastic over the row cover to make it more snowproof. You really need to tighten up the plastic and the row cover if you wanna make it windproof. So it's got a really good chart here about planting and harvesting dates when you would plant versus number of days from planting to harvest. And right here he has in their cool house, which is basically a greenhouse that he has that they heat it just enough to keep it from freezing. And then the cold house is kind of like my caterpillar tunnel, or it would be like a, a high tunnel where it's unheated. And those are the differences in the harvesting and planting dates that they figured out. He also has some other like smaller structures that you can make. This is a structural frame of A-frame greenhouse. So it, the A-frame greenhouse keeps winter compost supply unfrozen. That's a really good idea. Different cedars, weed control, cultivating, uh, and then more of the farming aspect like packaging. He also has some really good information about mobile greenhouses, which is something that I am interested in, but probably won't do anytime soon. But if you are looking to do any winter growing, this is a really good resource for that.